Mas ela pediu para falar isso com ela antes de falar com esse cuja palavra é isso. É isso. É a tal de rei. E ela só falar com a Helen. Then are we are we okay on Zoom? We're live. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. unmuted and things. Um, so welcome to everyone on Zoom and everyone in the room. It's a real pleasure to be hosting this Food Equity Seminar, Food Equity Center Seminar, um, and a particular pleasure to uh, welcome Luciana, uh, who's going to make the presentation today, looking at some of her experiences and reflections on food redistribution and social protection in Sao Paulo during COVID-19. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I almost feel I don't need to introduce Luciana. She is uh, so well known and such a long standing friend of IDS, but I'm aware there may be some people who don't know her so well, so bear with me. Um, Luciana is a professor of management of sustainable operations at the Getulio Vargas Foundation, one of Brazil's leading um, academic institute, particularly strong in, in areas like business and economics. Um, she's also um, well, has a long history here with the UK, so her PhD is from the University of Reading in Agricultural Economics, um, but she's also been a visiting fellow both here at IDS and at King's College. Um, and um, we're working with Luciana um, on one particular project that's uh, just getting started now uh, on Building Back Better from Below, which is a collaboration between the University of Toronto, um, our Brazilian counterparts and IDS, um, looking at um, social innovations in response to COVID-19 in areas particularly related to food, health, and also sort of governance and participation. Um, and the, the project is really keen to understand those experiences, so, sort of the trajectories and outcomes, but also look at questions around the sustainability of these sorts of innovations over time. And it's a very much an action research project together with local activists and, and, and different um, actors in three cities in particular. So it's looking at the experience here in Brighton, Toronto, and then Sao Paulo. And, um, I guess your experiences that you'll be talking about today sort of uh, help to inform that collaboration, um, although uh, the, the, the research is, is yet to come. Um, so what else do I need to say? I, I'd just like to um, also make the link for those of you uh, who don't know, last week um, we had Ronald Ranta, who we're glad mm -hmm. to have with us here today speaking on some very similar topics, but in a very different context here in the UK. So looking at the experience in Southwest London and in Brighton around an, an emergency food aid, um, problematic uh, framing perhaps, but emergency food aid and food banks and different sort of models of food banks. And you'll be talking about different models of redistribution and the experiences in Sao Paulo. So I hope that will um, generate some interesting discussions Luciana will talk for maybe 30, maximum 40 minutes, and, and, and I then we'll open yeah. to those on Zoom and to those in the room for discussion. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jody. It's a pleasure to be here and see so many faces, friendly friend faces. And, uh, you know, after these two years that we could meet just by Zoom, so it's very good to be here. Thanks for the invitation, this opportunity, and also looking forward for this collaboration on this new project. It's a very, you know, amazing project, very difficult, I think, <laughs> <laughs> to connect all these countries, all these topics. So I hope that I bring some insights. This, what I'm presenting, is not really uh, it's not really a research project, but uh, some of my experience during the COVID. It's something that I was doing voluntarily. You know, uh, everybody I think was trying to engage and to help during the COVID. 
with some action. So I, I was helping, you know, the food bank, the municipality food bank in Sao Paulo. And out of this experience, out of this work, we came up with uh, several actions and projects. So I'm going to talk more about the, the ground, you know, what I was looking, what I was doing during the COVID. And this is the name of one of the projects because out of these three cases that I'm going to present, uh, I send a proposal to PAPESP, which is our sponsor in Sao Paulo, and got a grant uh, to have then a, a scientific uh, uh, project to look more deeply into these models of redistribution. So basically how I got involved with this topic, I've been working with food waste for a while, several projects, lots of publications looking at food waste. And I was also part of a intersector uh, committee in Brasilia, in, in the ministry, uh, where we are kind of creating guidelines for food waste prevention. So I had lots of contacts with people from the federal government. <coughs> also with the Sao Paulo municipality, where we were doing, uh, you know, many actions, many prevention actions uh, for the food waste. So this is uh, something from the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Uh, and uh, we were using these in terms of uh, defining different actions uh, to prevent food waste. So we have lots of people on the uh, field work, you know, working with street markets, so, uh, with retailers, with supermarkets. So I was very into action when the COVID came and we had to stop basically everything that we were doing at that time about that. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, I was trying to help uh, the municipality, the Sao Paulo Municipality Food Bank in terms of management. You know, they were very precarious in terms of management. Uh, they scale increased and they didn't have how to manage, how to distribute, how to uh, attend, how to serve more people, more vulnerable uh, people, how to do the logistic. The logistic part was very difficult for them. So at the time I was with a colleague, Priscilla Miguel, we were uh, helping them even with, uh, you know, spreadsheets. We were doing these spreadsheets. We are putting our undergrad students to do the spreadsheets for them because they, they couldn't really manage the amount of uh, donations and the amount of people in need at the time. This was 20 cents. So uh, will, we will start talking about the context and then I'll go to the, to the table. So this is the, if you're not aware, you know, uh, we had uh, this data from Rede Pensão from uh, 2020. And now last week, Renato Maluf presented a new report that I just put in yellow, you know. So we have three, 33 million of people in hunger in Brazil, post-COVID, so this more than double. So this was the data before that we were using as a context for this, uh, this research project for PAPESP and now we have the new data, which was, you know, we were all devastated last week. It was last Tuesday when we got this report and the webinar, and I'm sure that Renato is translating uh, and sending this to you. But anyway, that was the, what, that's what we were living, especially when you have a human town like Sao Paulo, it's impossible to ignore, to not see what's happening outside. Lots of people homeless, lots of people asking for food, you know, <coughs> begging. So it was you know, in front of restaurants, in front of supermarkets, especially during the COVID, everything was closed. They didn't have uh, any leftovers to eat. So it became, you know, a very, uh, uh, strong and you could see on the streets, you could see everywhere, you know, these people looking for food, especially people coming from rural areas as well. And that uh, Renato's uh, report last week showed that people from rural areas were really bad affected, you know, small producers because they couldn't take their uh, production to the city centers, everything was closed, you know. And then uh, they were also on police security. So they, they also came to the city and people from neighborhood states like uh, Paraná, they also moved to Sao Paulo because Sao Paulo is wealthy, it's big. 
so they they were trying uh, to get some food in the center of the city. And uh, what happened very quickly in 2020 was that we didn't have any kind of law regulation for food redistribution. And there was one little, uh, a project, uh, a bid that was in, in the Congress for almost 10 years. And it was quickly approved in March, 2020 that we call the law of Good Samaritan that was uh, kind of help, you know, uh, the question of liability. Uh, from retailers and restaurants because then they, they, it was not that strict because what was happening before that is that the retailers, they were putting everything in the bin because otherwise if they donate, they could have some problems because the, the food, you know, that, that the food safety is not good. It has any problems. So that, uh, that was good. The Congress uh, kind of uh, sped up this law. Uh, and this also increased the donations, especially from big retailers. The, uh, the, the largest, uh, the big donor in Brazil is Carrefour, you know, the, the French, and, uh, and uh, it increased the numbers uh, of food donations, especially perishable foods, you know, like fresh foods and also, you know, which was important because of the nutritional content. But uh, what we could also see in the field work at that time is that lots of things that were not able to consume anymore were being donated, you know, rotting bananas, rotting tomatoes, things that were not in, uh, able to be uh, distributed for vulnerable. So you have big numbers of donations, but what could be edible was not the same <clears throat> what was donated. So that's what we are also looking in the spreadsheet because uh, these big donors, they need to make like a compliance with their host uh, country, for example, with France. So if they donate, they want to know how, uh, uh, who received that food. And uh, there was a lot of waste in the food bank because the, the food was not proper for it. For eating. And this was a problem for the for the donors because they wanted to show off, you know, how much they were donating. And all, of course, we have the, the big uh, food companies also donating insulin on liver, and that was basically processed food. So for the nutritionists that were in the food bank, she had to kind of uh, inspect, and there was only one in the in the food bank of the municipality of São Paulo, which is the largest. And there's no cold chain, so everything was coming during the day. She will have to look, see what was uh, possible, you know, to redistribute, and in what conditions and for whom, you know, if it was fresh food for children, things that could go for old people, and things like this. Even Cracolandia, because I, well, the good thing about this municipality food bank, different from the the private ones. They go to these areas where people don't have an ID, like Cracolândia is the people that are addicted in São Paulo. So people that don't have an ID, they are not organized on any NGO. They are not, you know, part of an institution that uh, can easily be uh, kind of put into the account. So they go to these people that are homeless and these people that. Uh, and Cracolândia, so people that wouldn't have any other kind of uh, source of food, because usually the private food banks, they go for more organized uh, the NGOs, you know, uh, and uh, because then they can do the, the compliance stuff as well. This, that's something that came out at this part, compliance is very important for the donors. And it's very difficult because they were donating tons and then you have units, and so it was a mess. So we were working spreadsheets to try to standardize this. And then we have this huge institute. I don't know if I call this institutional void, but anyway, we have the Conseil Dismantle in the first day of the government, of Bolsonaro's government. We didn't have any regulation or institutional framework. We didn't have any kind of um, strategies. The Ministry of Agriculture created a committee, but the committee was very slow, very slow to respond <coughs> uh, to COVID. Uh, so on the other hand, and that's what I wanted uh, also to tackle here, uh, we have many initiatives from civil society health. 
thing, you know, even from private sector, you know, everybody was trying uh, to help some way. Everybody was seeing this on the streets. This is also from the presentation that Renato did last week. It's the only one, there are so many, but uh, you know, how this increased from 2018 to this research that he presented the, the, the most recent data, especially in regions. So what I just want to, to call your attention is that I'm talking about Sao Paulo, which is the wealthy city and it's the uh, Southeast region. So this is 25%. But if we kind of expand uh, to try to, to understand, to see what's happening in the North, where you have 45%, or in the North is 38%, you know, uh, you have uh, half of the population, you know, uh, going to food insecurity. So what I'm talking is very focused on one big city. So the whole country, you know, is much worse. When we see so basically, when we started to, to, to do this work, uh, which was trying to have the food bank, and after that, looking to other initiatives, we still and I we wanted to see uh, how they were doing this food waste reduction because that was something that we've been working before uh, and during the COVID and how what were the barriers and what can be improved. So this was kind of, not his search questions, but were some questions to guide us to what we should look. So uh, in, in, in the uh, food bank in Sao Paulo food bank, what was very interesting, of course, we have lots of data about that, you know, lots of logistic data, but I'm just going uh, to focus on on this initiative, because I think this initiative was very valuable. Uh, Sao Paulo has kind of 900 street markets, so it's a very strong distribution channel in, in Brazil. People prefer to buy fresh food from the street market than supermarkets. Uh, and these uh, street markets are, are, are located all over the city. You know, you have, uh, uh, there are no, I think there are no food deserts through these street markets, even if the prices are higher in some areas than others, but they kind of reach the whole city. And, uh, and then what the municipality was doing is, uh, and then we were developing this before the COVID, but it increased afterwards. We were training the street market vendors, you know, to reduce the food waste. So things that they would throw in the bin we were uh, showing that uh, was some nutritional value, nutritional content in, in their uh, food in, that was not a waste. And they were uh, kind of uh, separating this from the bin. Because at the end of the street market, we have a, a, what's called barrison. So they come cleaning everything. So they take the rest of the waste with plastic, with garbage, with everything. So we were trying to make them, you know, uh, uh, developing this uh, capacity to rescue this food. And this food was being uh, redirect to the, to the food bank. So this was something that we, we, we put some undergrad students to do the training. You know, we could uh, rescue 120 kilos of food on each street market. And the, uh, the street market in Brazil, it finishes around noon. So at two, three o'clock, we could take this food to the food bank and then the food bank could call and redistribute. So this was fresh food, nutritional food, uh, you know, food that uh, were distributed to children, uh, to old people, to Krakolange. So, uh, it increased as well the number of charities. Uh, as that in the beginning, uh, it was uh, supplying 250, I think, and at the end was 320 mm -hmm. charities that were, uh, you know, uh, receiving this food. Uh, one problem that we have is that uh, the social assistants that were supposed to go to these charities and see what were the conditions of, you know, the place, the facilities, if they could cook the food, if they, you know, what kind of facilities they have to receive the food, they were uh, 
you know, they could not go out because of the COVID. So this was something that we could not assure that the final beneficiary would really receive the food. And this was something that uh, we heard rumors because you know Brazil that people were <laughs> sending this food uh, and and uh, and trying to sell it in these lungs. Mm -hmm. You know there was corruption mm -hmm. after from the NGO to the end beneficiary the food was not getting. But this was something that we wanted to develop a kind of traceability system, but it was very difficult to have it because many of these people, they don't have an ID, they don't have a smartphone to check in and say, well, we got it. So this was something to be done. We could not really, I put one of my PhD students to try to develop and she wanted to do blockchain. And I said, no, no, we have to do something <laughs> with some very indigenous technology, <laughs> social technology, because this will not work for this kind of, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable people in Brazil. But anyway, this is something to be done. And I'm, I'm going to talk about technology at the end, because this is something we learned from our <coughs> This, sorry, it's important because I just decided to add at the end, because this was, uh, just some notes that we were uh, making during the, this voluntary work to, to organize the logistics, but just to show that we were looking at the supply chain. So basically we were looking to the donors. Uh, Banco de Alimentos, uh, the food bank was the distributor. So it, it was not doing anything, it was just receiving, seeing the conditions, you know, assessing how are the conditions and then uh, distributing to the NGOs. So this part of the chain, you know, which would be the, the, the next step, we, we didn't really uh, could talk. We had several meetings and then I have a, another research a survey that we did uh, with these 300 NGOs, but more to see what were their needs, what uh, how they were organized, and even in Sao Paulo, what uh, where they were located, in which regions, because then they could share like uh, transport, you know, they could go together because that was a problem. They, these uh, NGOs do not have a car, they do not own their a car or a lorry, so they needed to rent or ask someone to go to pick up the food. So we were trying to organize logistically. So this uh, was what we were mapping. We have several, several <laughs> slides about that research uh, that we were doing to organize our actions at the time. But then I was interested. Uh, this was the end of 2020. We also uh, gave to our undergrad students a challenge. They have to sort out this problem, you know. So they did everything in action. They visited the, the food bank through a video. You know, the nutritionist was with her iPhone, she was showing the whole process, the whole flow, and they had to do the challenge and they gave great solutions, you know, they are very creative. So this was one of the slides that we used to, to show them what was the problem. But uh, then I was interested <coughs> on, on this distribution, on this model, which was so precarious for the municipal food bank. And then we start to talk and look at other initiatives that were happening and were increasing at the time. So we have Connecting Food. That was one of our students. I think Andrea was taught her as well. I was, doing, I was on her vibe. She was one of our master students. She has been working with this for a while, but it increased tremendously during the, the COVID. So it's a social impact business. And what she was doing is she managed the waste for the retailer. When we were interviewing Carrefour and other retailers, they always say that uh, for them, you know, uh, food waste is a kind of waste. So the way that they were going to convince uh, the, the CEO to donate was showing that it would be economically uh, important for them. You know, not because of it doing the good, but because economically, it would be a way of managing the waste, not taking to the landfill. So, uh, and, and she got into this kind of business. She works uh, with a system. So these retailers pay her to manage the waste. 
uh, and these waste that are in conditions of donation, she uh, redistribute to to this uh, to several NGOs. So at that time, uh, she she was uh, she had like nine employees, but very high tech. She called the company of food tech. And then she was a ten, uh, she was serving 160 new food retailers. So she was operating at the time more in, in Sao Paulo. But uh, now I, uh, I've been following her in the social media. She's in the Northeast as well. So she's expanding this work. She's getting money and, uh, and she's helping people and everything goes very, you know, dynamically. So it's a kind of a bridge between those that want to donate, but differently from car food, you know, they don't donate directly to the company, uh, to connecting to the donates. So GPA, which is the second largest retail uh, in Brazil, Pão de Açúcar, <coughs> I don't know the name in French, but it's also French. It's a Casino. 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 Uh, works with her, you know, she manages all the food waste and then she redirects to NGO. So it's a very interesting uh, business model. <laughs> we are in you know, business management, so <laughs> we are looking at this, you know, and, and the time is she, she gets everything on time and the, the communication. And then there was also this initiative. And Alex asked me to talk about failure, not failure, but something that is not uh, uh, happening anymore. Because I think in a way, everybody was uh, trying to help as I was trying to help with uh, Priscilla. This was an initiative from a, a other business school, INSPER. And then INSPER did something which was very important that was create a short supply chain. They call Campo Favela. So, uh, because these small uh, food producers were not able to, to deliver the food, of, uh, to sell the food in the city, because basically everything was closed, the restaurants were closed, they created a way of financing uh, a minimum price for these food producers and taking it directly to the favelas. So, they put a lot of effort uh, on this, you know, so it was a short supply chain. So, and so these producers were getting some money and reducing their food insecurity as well because they were not able uh, to produce and to sell their products. And uh, people from favelas, from the Island were, were also getting fresh food. And it was very well organized. I'll show, I have the links for the for these websites later, there are videos and uh, but uh, we spoke to them because actually one of the guys that were in charge of this was our former student <laughs> as well. <laughs> he came from FGV. So there's a lot of connections <laughs> with the alumni. And then after 11 months uh, of operation, you know, then they, they kind of uh, quit. You know, they did a lot. Of, they did a lot of work. You know, high volumes, but it was also voluntary work. So different from connecting food, which which was you know a way of economically. Uh, also, when was getting money out of the social impact business, uh, Campo Favela <clears throat> was an action that engaged the students and the professors from this business school. But it, uh, you know, they said that it was. It was a time limit for what they were able to do. They could not do it anymore. But I mean, as you saw the numbers uh, from the last uh, report that Renato uh, presented the last week, you know, the food insecurity increased a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think many people, uh, you know, the, the society is not that touched by the situation anymore because most are now working again, working, going out of the house. But uh, the food insecurity is, is higher than before. So, I don't know. But this was a very interesting project. So, just some ideas that uh, we had at the time, you know, in terms of what we learned uh, and, uh, from these talks and from these observations. But as I said before, this was not a, 
a scientific research. We were not to structure, you know, collecting data. It was something that we were doing and learning as we were doing. So the need to create regulations. Uh, so I'm part of a committee in the Ministry of Agriculture. We are trying to create a new regulation for retailers. So it's a much stakeholder uh, committee. Uh, and it, it's uh, led by the Minister of Agriculture. Everything so slow in the federal government, but we've been talking and talking and talking anyway. Yeah. But it's something to facilitate donations even more. Uh, we think that uh, that we were looking at food losses and waste be before it was valuable, you know, to see food redistribution because in a way, you have this environmental problem, which is food waste, but you also have the social problem. So you need a ways to prevent that. And uh, of course, we've been working with consumers as well as the household food waste. And at that point, you cannot do anything else. So we are trying to work through a supply chain to, to prevent this food waste. And also something that came especially from Connect Food, but from other food techs that we've been <coughs> talking, you know, is there are no tax incentives for, for this kind of business, of social impact business. So they don't have uh, any kind of recognition in terms of taxes. So this is something that we need to lobby. Uh, and on the supply chain level, which I call meso that will also, you know, to have these actions, you know, uh, because when we were starting uh, this food redistribution and looking at the literature, you know, especially on food waste, everything is about environmental impact, especially here in Europe, you know, not use of landfills, composting. But for a country like Brazil, with this food insecurity, we also need the social impact of a distribution of food. So everybody has to be aware of what. Uh, you know, before it's not able to be edible anymore. Uh, incorporate technology, and this was a, a big problem for the public sector because they have so many restrictions, budget restrictions, human resource restrictions in terms of the, uh, it could hire. So the use of technology speed up the whole process that are very easy technology that can be implemented. Communication to generate more engagement. There is no communication, even in this supply chain, you know, between donors, between uh, the food bank, uh, between the NGOs, there is a lack of communication. The needs of the NGOs were not being listened by the food bank because everything was so into emergency at the time. Uh, and uh, at the micro level, the technology were able for citizens as well, so uh, platforms where we can tell what is going to be wasted. We, uh, you know, you have lots of apps nowadays that help this, but in Brazil, people do not use them. And also uh, to carry out other actions in relation to food that we have long-term solutions. Of course, many of them, uh, as we are looking at this level, it depends also on consumer awareness of food insecurity or food waste. And this is very cultural in Brazil, you know, this concept of abundance. You know, you have to have a full table, full plates, lots of food, eat as much as you can, and all this food is going to be thrown in the bin. So this is very cultural, so we need to create this awareness mm -hmm. in the long term, so there's some uh, campaign, some awareness campaign in, in, the, in the government, but uh, we have to think on solutions on changing behaviors, not just behaviors from consumers, but from uh, business, from uh, retailers, you know, because much of the food that we, we could see in the street market was the ugly food, you know, food that are not perfect, stuff. Uh, and then they are going to the bin because they don't look nice, they don't look perfect. So this is kind of a change of behavior. I don't know the time. It's good. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see it. I don't have much. Okay, so just some actions that we are doing uh, as an extension of this work. 
um, before we start to talk about the team, you know. Uh, we are working on the food waste index uh, that is sponsored by the United <coughs> Nations. So it's measured at the household. We are collecting data in Brazil. Uh, well, this index is being built all over the world. We are collecting the data in Brazil. It's going to be collected in August and uh, September. And this is a partnership between FGV and uh, Embrapa. So this is something that we exactly to create this awareness on consumers you know we are going to we did a, a, a previous research on that that is going to be published on sustainable consumption production journal but this is more specifically we are using gravimetria gravimetria that we are going to measure what is what is going to the bin mm -hmm. to have an index you know and uh, and uh, see what types of food in our previous research, there was a lot of rice, beans, and meat going to the bin at the household. But then people were taking pictures of, uh, you know, at the end of the meal and sending the pictures. We surveyed like 600 people. Now we are going to work on this gravimetric method. So we are going to measure in the bin. <laughs> so we have to put it. <laughs> and we did a pilot uh, and we are in Brasilia and uh, Ribeirão Preto two weeks ago. And now we are going to do the, it's going to be collected in Rio de Janeiro. So on the location in, in August and September. But something that I think brings me to this group, always not in this project, <laughs> but in so many projects. The exchange is experience about these different models of food redistribution to make them permanent and sustainable because we saw so many initiatives, but those initiatives were not sustainable, you know, and, and the public sector should not be the only one responsible. We can do something as citizens and, you know, civil society, as universities. Uh, we also have approved the uh, Center for Waste Management. I don't know if Andrea knows. Yeah, we got uh, 18 million uh, from FAPESP. So it's going to be a waste management. I'm in charge of the food waste. And uh, Susana Pereira, my colleague of uh, Embalage. <laughs> this project is all in Portuguese. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so she's in charge of package and I'm in charge of, uh, and we have a partnership with Ambev, Braskem, Braslat, and many other companies. So uh, <coughs> we should start soon. Now we are doing lots of paperwork and signatures and contracts, but that's a good, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, news for, for, for the group. Something that I'm also interested in and uh, have one KG that is working on corporate philanthropy, because I think this is very Anglo-Saxon, but in Brazil is kind of new. We want to try to keep these uh, companies that were donating, you know, uh, engaged in, in, in donation, not just for donations. So she's doing her thesis uh, on that topic. <laughs> We are also uh, working with the municipality to increase this partnership with street market vendors. Uh, what they are saying to us is now that they don't have even anything to donate because at the end of the day, uh, uh, these street market uh, vendors sell everything cheap and people don't have money now in Brazil. So they buy the, the shape, but you know, something that is uh, with a price below what it used to be. And they don't have anything else for the for the donations because everybody now has a, you know uh, money restrictions and are uh, facing insecurity. And also, you know, this policy making to facilitate donations. So there are a number of actions, and uh, of course, these scientific uh, projects are going to give us some background, some ideas, hopefully some papers, but. Uh, I see this much more as an applied project, something that we really can make a social impact. That's what I prefer. Quickly? Ah, okay. So some of these results are being published in this book that is coming out in September, and there is another thing that are you know, still under review or coming 
here. But anyway, if you want more details about this scientific paper, I can send you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, both uh, brilliant insights, but also very good timekeeping. We have about 20 minutes left, so, so some decent time to get into some discussion. I think, you know, my reflection, um, and I've got sort of Rani's presentation last week very much in my head, as well as how we're thinking about the, the Build Back Better from Below project. Um, and, you know, lots of quite similar issues and kind of similar in the big picture but then when you look at the actual actors involved and some of the details really quite different so so i think there'll be interesting things coming out of our project but also hopefully today um it's interesting and this might be a personal bias as well as maybe a, a bias a bit in our project but corporate philanthropy is not something that comes through very strongly in what i know about what happened in the uk and again mm -hmm. that that kind of maybe reflects my interest a little bit more in some of the social enterprises and some of the uh, more sort of grassroots or, or uh, community led <coughs> economic structures, if you like. Um, but yeah, that was that was something that, that struck me. Um, and some of the initiatives we've been looking at have been, for example, how maybe sort of more middle-sized businesses repurpose themselves during the pandemic, even if that was temporarily, that they were restaurants or, or other types of food businesses that were then trying to um, be part of the community response to food insecurity. But I'm sure there's others in the room who've got different perspectives or different insights. I'm just sort of getting my head around what we have, what actually happened in the UK beyond what I picked up through the news, etc. Um, but let's see if there's questions or comments. I, I, I know Luciana would be certainly happy to answer questions, but also very keen on discussion and dialogue and, yeah. and reflection. Um, maybe I'll check uh, first for those online, um, if there's any um, comments or questions that um, they would like to make. I, I'm going to do it. Okay, yeah, but I, I think with this not such a large group so probably you could either put your hand up and we'll call on you or if you want to type something in the chat box and i will sit <laughs> it's okay <laughs> i think people will can I hear me sitting from yeah you should be okay. no ayako i can see has her hand up so why don't you go ahead ayako sharing your experiences from Brazil. I was just wondering, maybe this goes more towards the debate and discussions, but whether there has been any debate in Brazil about the uh, advantages and disadvantages of short versus long value chains. I think you mentioned quite a number of different options and you know, for, for your case study on the um, direct supply from small scale uh, producers to the urban areas that they couldn't access is an example where um, these shorter value chains can respond fairly quickly to these situations. But also, you know, you gave an uh, extensive example from Carrefour and these larger corporations managing the longer supply chains. And I just wondered if there was any debate whether, you know, going into the future, whether mm -hmm. shorter value chains are more desirable in terms of food system resilience and equity and also meeting the needs for nutritional and yeah like nutritional needs of the marginalized people thank you sweets if it's okay should we see if there's one or two more and then okay okay um was there another question or comment online If, if not, I'll come to the room and we can always go back online uh, for the next round. Alex, go ahead. Thanks, Luciana. That was great. So, 
We've got two questions from that too. One's micro, one's micro. <laughs> <laughs> so the micro one was actually based on when I was living in Sao Paulo, I was very struck by the social relations around the failures leaders, around the street markets. And the fact that then at least, as is going back a decade or so, uh, as the as the failure goes on, the prices drop, right? Yeah. Because the higher quality produce yeah. is gone. And there's a tipping point where they're selling below cost. And then there's actually a point where all of the street kids who've been gathering around start getting the food for free. Yeah. So this is actually a very short supply <laughs> chain. This is literally the kid waiting yeah. for the guy to give the signal saying, okay, you know, you can come and get a basket of oranges or whatever. Mm -hmm. Did you did that disappear either before or during the pandemic? In other words, did you see an impact um, from change social relations in general, the impact of the pandemic specifically on these informal redistributive mechanisms? And, and or how did your discussions with the field agents, with the, with the vendors uh, relate to these, you know, these kind of informal social mechanisms of, of redistribution? Did that come up at all? So that's my kind of micro more mm -hmm. anthropological question, if you like. But the macro one was, Relating to the discussion after Ronnie's seminar, which was, uh, I, I, I think you made the point about the need for more kind of transformative, strategic, you know, shifting the political and policy debate, and and, and where is the energy for that in the UK around food insecurity, hunger, um, and I'm reminded in Brazil the campaign of Vichinho, the hunger campaign mm -hmm. of the 90s, tried to do that, appeared to have failed, but subsequently the politicization of hunger came through the presidential election. Mm -hmm pain and Lula's promise of zero hunger and so on. So the political system did pick up on the political unacceptability of chronic hunger. Mm -hmm. Do you see signs in Brazil today mm -hmm. where you said there's, you know, actually food insecurity skyrocketing mm -hmm. and other people are telling us, but is the political energy around that particular tension also gaining ground or not? Uh, and, and if not, what would it take to repeat that kind of late 90s moment of um, kind of a societal acceptance that hunger is political. Since Alex abused his <laughs> two questions, we better give you a chance to respond to those okay. three. Okay, so uh, we start with the short and long supply chain. I think even what uh, Jody pay attention about and all the corporate philanthropy, I think this is a bias because we are working in a business school and in Sao Paulo. So all the business are there and they are very related to ESG and these kind of things were very promoted, you know, even our alumni that work in these big multinationals, they wanted to help us during these actions and that the voluntary work, but also take a picture, you know, that they were kind of uh, giving us a lorry to pick up the food and things like this. And the short supply chains, I think it's, uh, uh, Academically, we all think it's more important and they are more resilient, but we didn't see this happening. We didn't see any kind of incentive from the government. I was trying as a member of this committee in the Ministry of Agriculture to bring CONAB, which is the, the uh, organism that is responsible for food distribution in Brazil. To, to help us, you know, uh, to give a, a, a minimum price for these products, for these guys to be able, to, you know, to not, uh, to be in the business because they were not uh, coming to the city anymore, you know, they were supplying restaurants that were closed and then all the business were struggling. And Konabi didn't have any data, they didn't make anything. They even asked me if I knew how many producers were not being able to commercialize, you know, what kind of data they should have because that's what. So I, I didn't see any kind of uh, movement in a way of enforcing the short supply chains. That's why I brought the Cabela example, but they were academics, you know, and we have some examples with, from things that happened, but they happened eventually. They, they were not planned. And these uh, long supply chains the, the, is, is like I, I said, I think these corporations, they have, of course, uh, the, the social corporate responsibility, but they also uh, were trying to help in a way and promote it more into the media. Even the Abras, which is the, uh, retailer association, they had a, they, uh, they made a strategic plan last November following SDGs 
and the, the priority for them is in hunger. So, I mean, I'm not saying that they are right, but they've been promoting this very successful, you know, even if you go to the shop or to the guy that is managing the operation, you don't see that happening. You know, sometimes for them, it's very expensive to keep the donations there because it would need the, the cold chain or would need the transport. But they have this discourse, but of course, I didn't really check this scientifically or triangulation, but, uh, but I think the short supply chains that we thought would increase, they, they kind of disappear mm -hmm. because many of, uh, you know, uh, good name markets were closed and things like this. Okay, uh, Alex, I, I, what I've been heard in, uh, hearing from these uh, vendors is that um, now they don't have anything to distribute at the end mm -hmm. of the fair because of course there are lots of people around waiting to get something kids old people homeless now they are all around but uh, what they are and the food went up as well right. the price went up not maybe up the price didn't go as here because here you depend on other countries and then you had the Brexit because in Brazil, we didn't have a lockdown. So the factories didn't stop, the, the agribusiness didn't stop. But we have a lack of policies as well. The rice went really up because all the rice was being exported instead of being supplied for the domestic market. So we have some lack of, not lack of products, but products that we produce in large scale, but they were, you know, the export market was always uh, priority instead of the domestic market. So there was no policy for, for food prices at all. <clears throat> and there's no policy for anything. <laughs> so that's the second question. You know, I think as some of the Cidadania, Betinho, and, and all these initiatives that are more organized, like Mesa Brasil, they grew a lot and people trust you know, uh, these initiatives donate uh, money. So it's philanthropy, they, they do not donate that much food, but they donate money. But I don't see in this government any kind of, of plan or incorporating this as a policy. We are in this electoral year. So I just see a change in, in the change in the government. So there's no discourse about, uh, and, and that, why I think it was very important to have the, the report last week. It was very strong in the media mm -hmm. about the food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very strong, but it's like this, it's like, you know, this, uh, the two guys uh, in, in, in the Amazon. You see this in the media and then after <clears throat> one or two weeks, you don't know what happened, you don't have the, the follow-up. So, uh, I don't mm -hmm. see in this, not even in, in, in the other candidates, I don't see they talking about uh, food security. About economic price, yes. Fuel prices, yes. Mm -hmm. It's like these people are invisible, it's 33 million. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm pessimistic. So to take one more round, I think we've got uh, time for one more round of questions. Um, I see one online, Anusu, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Luciana. It's uh, really fascinating listening to um, the initiatives. Um, I mean, it sounds like a logistical marvel in how you were able to initiate and redistribute surplus food from street markets. Um, and how did you coordinate that with 300 um, charities? And what is the relationship with the local government? And also one final question. Um, what is the impact on public policy on longer term food strategy? I know you're touching on it now. Thank you. Did you hear that? No, the, the beginning idea, I didn't have to catch. The question of logistics, the distribution of tantos feiras, tantos mercados, and the Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Um, you, I think you snuck three questions in there, so you're making Alex look good. <laughs> <laughs> Any, <Sorry>. anyone, else? <laughs> anyone else online? Okay, <coughs> just building on this issue of surplus food and food waste. So, what's the discourse in general in Brazil about the idea of using food waste or surplus food to feed people who need food? And if there's a reduction in the amount of surplus food, then doesn't this put the whole strategy into question? 
question. And yeah. Nick. <laughs> sorry, no, we got, sorry, I, well, but I, yeah. Go ahead. Mine was very similar to what <laughs> Freddie just asked. It's, it's just this, it's a question about, I and mean, to maybe it's a question to Ronnie as well based on last week, but it's a question about what, what is the sustainability of the model here? Because you know, actually the, in this country, the third sector do deliver a lot of services, but they're they're funded to by the government. There has to be that element. And it's I don't think this idea of sustainability should always be but it has to stand on its its two feet, but there has to be a source, there has to be revenue coming in somehow, but it, sometimes that is the, the role of the state to provide that revenue. I know it's not going to happen anytime soon in, in Brazil or the UK, but I think we can't get away from that, that no. model, but it's one of the kind of things mm -hmm. that just my comment follows from Nick, so can I just have one minute? <laughs> very <laughs> very <laughs> second. Thank very you very much, uh, Luciana, I really that, enjoyed so. that. There's something passed my mind uh, as, as well with Ronnie last week about this, idea that you know in other contexts there is this concept it seems to be the abstract of concertina programming in other words programs expand and contract and you plan for expansion you plan for contraction and there's a lot of experience about that and i'm just wondering if this is a point that could be followed up in this sort of circumstance you don't expand willy-nilly but after a while you realize you have to plan for a contraction mm -hmm. okay. great i think we better Give, so stop there with questions. Luciana, a chance to respond. Um, we might run over very, very slightly. But, uh, well, uh, the logistical part is basically, uh, it's not very well coordinated, uh, you know, so you have uh, uh, what happens, the donors say, well, okay, we have these donations and then the food bank has one or two, no, four lorries and go with and fix it up and then take to the food bank and then have to, uh, you know, separate all the food to, to redistribute and then have to call the NGO and the NGO has to find a, a, a transport to pick up the food. So it's very badly coordinated, you know, and they are come from uh, far. And so that's what we were trying to have like a platform. And that's what we learned from connecting food have some platform that would do it, uh, you know, through IT, something that, but uh, there are no resources in, in the, the food bank, in the, muni in the municipality food bank. We have, of course, private food banks that are very well coordinated. So that was something that we were trying to help, but uh, it has to change. You, you need to put more uh, technology into this part. Uh, in terms of public policy, that's what the, the, the second question is. Okay, uh, I think that uh, in Brazil we have these three levels of policy. So when I was working with the municipality, I'm working with, uh, you know, Sao Paulo municipality that is very aligned to the state because they're the same government and they're very wealthy compared to the rest. So, of course, when I was in Brasilia, uh, before the COVID being part of this intersectoral uh, committee on food waste, I could see that what was happening in Sao Paulo was much more advanced than what was being discussed in Brazil. People in Brazil are very far from reality, you know, <laughs> and very low qualified as well. So, they, at least it's this experience. So, uh, so I decided to engage more with uh, the local uh, because they were trying to do things, you know, they, they, they were trying to look at benchmarks. So this idea about the street market vendors came from Sweden. You know, they were talking with the Swedish EPA and then they were doing this, but in a very small scale and the, the municipality, okay, let's do this capacity building for the vendors. So I see them doing much more actions, you know, so it, it depends on what level you look. Um, uh, I'm, I'm more confident about the local level policies, but it's a huge country. It doesn't affect the country at all, but at least the city. And uh, I think people are more qualified as well because uh, one of them, uh, people from the municipality might be able to, uh, to be with you in the meeting in Toronto, she speaks English. Mm -hmm. You go to Brazil, people don't speak English. You know, so they bring people to discuss and they need a translator. So, you know, there, there's a lot of problems in, 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 at least this is my experience, which is not very big on these issues. Uh, 
And then, uh, yeah, about the surplus. I agree completely. So that's why we were talking about the hierarchy. What we are trying to tackle is something that is happening now, is the surplus. But we would like to work in the prevention. And we would like to not have food insecurity in Brazil, of course. But at this time, you know, uh, we are trying to create this awareness at the household and trying to make people more aware, especially business and uh, even logistics about all that is wasted that could be redirected. But I think this is a very short term solution. This is something that came from COVID uh, basically, you know, uh, but the ideal world, we wouldn't have people. We would have a different way of you know, providing solution for this, but of course we can reduce the surplus. But that's the inequality of the country as well. As I said, at the household, you want everything, you buy more than you can eat, to use. you receive your friends with lots of food and then you put up, and if it's not fresh, you put everything in the bin, you don't eat the, the leftovers, you know, so this is part of the culture. And then on the other hand, do you have people taking food out of the bin to eat because they don't have anything else? So this inequality it's, it's very present in daily. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and that's what I think that Nick and, and Richard, in a way, are saying. Uh, I, I actually received a review from uh, uh, in one paper recently about the role of state, you know, it, 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 these. Food insecurity is the role of the state. You, you, why you, you're going to rely on private sector? You know, if, because the state is not, you know, providing anything. I mean, the state is absent. That's what we call the institutional void. You know, they are not doing what they should do. So in a way, you have uh, NGOs, but the NGOs as well. Some of them <coughs> don't work very well. They they cannot uh, uh, become permanent. They have lots of problems in terms of management, in terms of corruption. So you need the whole system to work properly, you know? And at this time when the institutional void happens, then you have other stakeholders taking this uh, role, you know, like citizens, universities, and NGOs, and private sector as well. But I don't think this can be permanent. I think this is something that we, not a response. I think it increases. And so I don't think the expansion is going to be uh, our way out of this crisis, you know. I think, uh, but at this time, with 33 million, we have to do whatever we can. You know. Anyway, I don't know if I reply to the question. It's a very good question. They need to think about them as well a bit. But thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Luciana. There was a lot of questions, so that reflects yeah, a yeah, lot of yeah. interest. Yeah. Um, and, and so we've slightly run over time. And we've got into the perennial debate of state versus market, mm -hmm. which will keep us here for the next, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know how many decades. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I think true. we'll close it there. Thank you so much again for your presentation. Thanks, everyone, for the great comments. And I look forward to the next Food Equity Seminar, which has been publicized in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have a meeting.